We have come to our last panel of the day. It's always a very popular one here at News Tech Forum where we take some of the leading technologists in the industry and ask them about all sorts of interesting things like AI, augmented reality, ATSC3, the list goes on. We are grateful here that uh, we have here today to shepherd that conversation. Andrea Berry, uh, CEO of the Gap Media Group, and she will introduce her panelists. Welcome. I know, it's like... From the left, from the right, I mean, I... It doesn't matter, I know your names. So. We have fewer microphones. Are you going to stand? Yeah, I'll, I'll stand, and that okay. way everybody has okay. a microphone. Okay. And can you guys hear us in the back? Yeah? Okay, great, thanks. Um, funny when we, uh, all day we've been talking about innovation, right? And uh, I'm also attending the SVG seminar. I guess it's upstairs because we're on the second floor, right? Um, and they're talking about innovation. And it seems like it never stops. And so I was sitting in the back of the room and I went on Google and said uh, the title of our um, topic today is Top Technologists and the Bleeding Edge. And we've got some top technologists here. But I wanted to, because it's the last session of the day, I wanted to give you a definition of what Google said bleeding edge was. It's the very, for, and it's a noun, guys. I don't understand that. But anyway, bleeding edge is a noun, and it's uh, the very forefront of technological advancements, an architecture that many people believe is still too bleeding edge for large mission critical si systems, which all of these folks here have mission critical systems. And the, then it says this technology that's so new that there's a high risk of it being reliable. And I don't think anybody in the news business would take very many high risks. You probably do, but not to the point where your shows go up in flames. So we're always very careful about that. Once again, my name is Andrea Berry. Uh, I've been in the television business since I was 18 years old, so it's been five years. And, uh, <laughs> And I'd like to introduce the panel first. We've got uh, Michael en Engelhop, who's the CTO of Graham Media. Tish Graham is ABC uh, O&O's TV stations. She's the VP of Broadcast Technology. We've got Hank Hundemer, who's the Tribune Broadcasting Senior Vice President of Engineering, and Mike Palmer with Mass Tech Innovations. And uh, he's the CTO. And I want to go through with their 30-second pitch of what they do, and then we'll get into our discussion. So why don't we start off with you, Mike? Sure, thank you. Um, in a broad sense, uh, the CTO position for Grand Media oversees the, uh, the call letter stations, uh, as well as uh, corporate enterprise computing, which uh, for the most part is focused on cybersecurity. We spend a lot of time on security issues and uh, as more and more uh, of the technology in our world is transitioning over from uh, discrete um, installations to more IP and interconnections, cybersecurity is a, is a lot of our, our day. Uh, and then also, of course, repack. So. There is repack, isn't there? Um, Tish Graham, I'm with the ABC-owned television station group, um, which is owned by Disney, so uh, when you talk about security, um, we're under the big umbrella of not only ABC, but also um, Disney. Um, I oversee the technology for the eight ABC-owned stations, um, both on, on the IT side and on the what many of us in, in years past would call traditional engineering, which is now, we, we see it as technology, um, and oversee that um, across the eight stations. And my name is Hank. I'm one of the engineers for Tribune Media. I take care of all of the systems that Tribune Media broadcast that basically doesn't touch cash. So, uh, so all the broadcasts, the news, the commercials, the spot. If it touches money, it's on the different side of the house, uh, and I don't do that. I'm also the uh, head software architect for a bunch of software that we write at Tribune, um, supported by a, a great group of engineers. And I'm Mike Palmer with Mastech. I'm the CTO. Our products uh, create uh, provide services 
that uh, tie pools of content together, whether you're using uh, BitCentral or Grass Valley or Avid, or your content needs to go into the uh, public or private cloud, hyper-converged, or even on-prem uh, ODA or LTO. We tie all of that together <clears throat> so all of your uh, products and your users can access that content in a, a single unified way. Okay, thank you folks. Um, I'm gonna start this, we, we want this discussion to be more organic as opposed to me going through the line. So I'm, I've given the, the panel a lot of freedom to, to make the discussion cool. And if you have any questions, I know we're slated for questions answer uh, at, at, towards the end, but also if something comes up that's really kind of uh, burning in your head, feel free to uh, raise your hand and, and we can talk about it. So we know that we're all problem solvers. Engineers and operations people are problem solvers. And sometimes in our attempts to solving problems, innovation arises, which is very cool. And so I wanted to know what, uh, and this is a double-edged question, I guess, what, what problems are you trying to solve in your news operation or in your business unit that have forced you to become innovative in your respective environments and where does that, and it could be cost, it could be anything, but what are the specific problems that really have arisen recently that have pushed you to go to the edge on, on technology? And anybody can begin to answer that. Well, I think for me it certainly was reduction in friction. I, um, I hate it when we struggle with technology. We as technologists should be sort of the opaque part of the position. And so a couple of weeks ago, I, uh, actually before Thanksgiving, I took a little bit of time and I rode around with, uh, with some of our news crews covering news and looking at where their pinch points are and really walking a mile in their shoes. And one of the areas that I'm focusing on uh, now and, and want to in 19 is how can we get the friction that exists between the news crews that are out there trying to do a great job and each of our platforms. How can we get metadata easily and, uh, and without a lot of work? And so uh, that's, that's really the area I, I, I want to reduce the friction. Sometimes the crews are getting so frustrated, they, they have the story, they have the video, they have the data, and some impediment is the way, whether it's a corporate VPN, or whether it's a slow connection, or whether it's somebody at the station is not where they need to be because they don't know that it's coming, uh, or some asset is in the station but not correctly labeled. I really think that we are in a position where, we have, where we're serving so many different platforms and masters that the reduction in friction in the workflow is really critical to what we need to work on. And that's what I'm, my focus, one of my focuses, and repack. And repack. And repack. Yeah, that's sort of, don't forget repack. I, I think, and we, we had talked about this earlier, and, and, and Hank talks about it as, as reduction in friction, and I talk about it as moving content across all of our platforms like water. So the end user doesn't care where it is or how it gets from point A to point B. If it needs to be a linear piece, if it needs to be an OTT or some type of digital piece, it, 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 we need to build the back-end systems as, and automate them as much as possible and, and to be able to move that content wherever it needs to go, whenever it needs to go, and, and to be reliable um, ac across not just an individual station but across the entire group. And, and to that has, is, is our focus, is our mantra, and everything that we do um, is, is focused on how do we move that content across all of our platforms like water. And w we hear that from our customers often as well. Um, many of our customers have many different locations um, and often use different types of technology. So within the same organization, we can be looking at somebody that's using LTO or ODA, and then they can be using public cloud, private cloud, moving to, to hyper-converged infrastructure. And the challenge there is how do you make all of that content, A, discoverable, mm -hmm. because that's the first step, but once you've got it discoverable, how do you move the essence and the metadata? Because we talked about that, the metadata now is just as important as the essence. How do you make that, again, move across the organization like water, but maybe in a way that is a service so that you can choose the, the applications that fit you best to expose that information from? 
So for instance, providing search across the organization as a service, so you can plug Avid or Grass Valley or whatever on top of that, but they don't have to worry about the details of where things are stored or how they get from point A to point B. I think that the um, previous examples were more uh, high level macro. I'll, I'll offer a more specific micro level example. It was a problem solve uh, that we were uh, tasked with in, in one of our stations. They needed a helicopter, but they couldn't afford a helicopter. And one of the panelists on, uh, on the prior session said, you know, a helicopter investment for most stations is around a million dollars. And a million dollars in Los Angeles, maybe in a top 20 or 25 market, is not a big deal, but in a top you know, go to market 40. That's a lot of money to spend for a news gathering tool. Um, and I said, you know what, there's a way to f solve this problem. And uh, we uh, looked at where is one of the cost points, and one of the cost points is the staff that flies the helicopter, there's the photographer, and there's the, the pilot. Well, you can't do without the pilot, at least not yet. <laughs> but the photographer is, is something that was a challenge. We had just put in um, a private LTE network in uh, the station in that market. So we had a private uh, LTE system that was bi-directional and it, one of the capabilities was as a bi-directional device it could offer remote control and data. Um, so we reached out to gimbal manufacturers and said can we remote control your gimbal if we're not in the helicopter? And a couple of them said no I don't think so we're not interested in that and one said sure let's give it a shot. So we worked with them over the uh, course of several months. We put in a gimbal system. Uh, it turns out it's a GSS for those uh, interested. And we remote control the gimbal from the station. So the, the operator in the automated control room, we have an Ignite system and a camera operator who's doing the robos and various other things. And when they call for the helicopter, he picks up the console that normally would sit in the helicopter and be operated by a dedicated uh, photographer. And he operates the gimbal he has full paint control on the camera, zoom focus, and uh, gimbal operation. That allowed us to reduce the cost basis for the helicopter, so now our station in the market has a chopper where we couldn't afford it. And I think that, um, you know, one example is present tense for news operations. Certainly, uh, LTE has come up a couple times in the panels uh, yet today. Uh, the question was asked earlier, is it, do we think it's viable? Is it something that's gonna uh, change our world? I think it's going to improve it, whether it's going to be a game changer yet to be seen. It's got a couple of years to, to be rolled out. Uh, but when we look at uh, co-FDM technology, which the vast majority of stations use for news gathering, that's pretty uh, long in the tooth. And most stations have had their systems in place since the Nextel transition. It doesn't last forever. And uh, do you want to spend another several hundred thousand dollars refreshing that uh, infrastructure with the same technology, which you could, or do you want to look at something different? Uh, we prefer to look in the something different category because we think it's a better investment long term. So, anybody, what 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 solutions are you coming up with? Um, uh, from we, you just talked about transporting content. Mm -hmm. uh, what have you done so far? Where do you see in the next year or so how you're going to achieve that goal of transporting content? We are looking a lot into um, cloud, both on-prem and, and public cloud, and to be able to move content um, in and out. Um, connectivity in the, in the vehicles and the truck, obviously, is very important. Um, we just are rolling out um, Dillette across our group, and they use uh, something called web space that allows our, our guys in the field to be able to, to grab content, edit, um, drop it right into the timeline and ready to go on air. So again, it's, it's getting that, taking that friction out, moving, moving um, the content wherever it needs to go. Um, so, so and, and we talked about this at breakfast today, we all got together for breakfast and metadata kept coming up and, and if, if we have to put, draw a line in the sand, and say starting today, or some of us starting a year ago, get as much metadata as you possibly can onto the content that you're producing now um, for, for monetization later, to be able to find things to, for, for, especially for an, for an OTT play or for uh, any kind of digital play, 
any kind of information you have on that clip is just so important. And then we talked about the archives and how, how some of our archives are 30, 40 years old and there is no, there is no metadata on that. And where, where do you go? Do you use it? What cloud technology do you use? What technology do you use to start to gather that information? Um, you'll, you'll hear many people say that you're sitting on a gold mine. We may be sitting on a gold mine. We may not, we have no idea what we're sitting on, but we, the technology is there now to, to run um, speech to text and to start to figure out what do we have? What can we use? What do we have rights to? What do we don't have rights to? And, it, and those are all of the, the things that, you know, 10 years ago, none of us had, to, none of us knew or thought about metadata or digital rights. And now it's, it's, it's front and center of what we do. And the metadata is, is not only controlling where the content goes in, in the distribution lifecycle with OTT and, and other things there, but it's also going to lifecycle management in, inside the archive. Mm -hmm. um, the, the archives, they're interesting in news, 90% of the archive will probably never be used, okay? The 10% that does has to justify the cost of everything else, but you really have to look at how much money you're spending on that archive. And if it's in a cloud, it becomes very obvious because it's an, an operational model there. But how much are you spending versus how much are you bringing back? So this really kind of leads you into a, a discussion of uh, at what bit rate do I store mm -hmm. things? How can I get the cost of that storage down? This cost of storage is more or less fixed. How can I make the, the file sizes smaller? And when do I do that? Well, you do that based upon the metadata that you have associated with the, the content. So the more metadata you have, not only is your, your content more likely to be sold, but it's also more likely to be compressed and cheaper to, to, to store over time. Yeah, and, and you know, when, when we put our Dillette system in, this is not the Dillette show, I do love you guys back there, but uh, we, and, and the Dillette guys can tell you when we did the system for Fox Sports, um, we did underestimate, if you remember, Arno, the, the amount of storage that we needed based on how we operated and how we had to change people's mindsets of how to operate, because we're no longer using tape workflows, but their mindset were in that tape workflow thing. Their brains were, were, were programmed to do the, that tape workflow uh, type of uh, mindset. So we had to really shift people's skill sets and, and how they operated uh, in general doing live TV and, and, and in, in the sports environment. Now, Hank, you have your own system. Explain to uh, um, how you guys are handling content management. Uh, so we wrote, Tribune Media runs all of their own systems. So we have no EMPS, iNews, Avid, BitCentral. We have our own uh, master control automation, play out, record. It's all done in-house. Uh, we've been doing it since 2008. And what that allows us to do is to be a little bit uh, different in that I don't adhere to anybody's standards. I don't have any VDCP. I have very little MOS. The only MOS I have drives, uh, drives my ROS overdrive and my, um, my prompter. I'm not so, offended. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Love you. We just don't use you. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so what that allows you to do is kind of a little bit different things than, than a lot of groups would do, where these, there's these natural silos. You know, where Moss, is, Moss does this, and VDCP, God love it, from, from Harris, it's still around, and we still, it's still, you know, we don't have any of that. And so it allows me to homogenize uh, that workflow and to do clever things, or at least I think clever things, like when we talk about friction, one of the things that we were not getting was where was this video shot? So if you put a small Bluetooth dock under the driver's seat of the van, when the guy's phone disconnects from that dock, he's getting out to shoot something. So then when the video comes back in, ask him, what is this video? Did you shoot it at one of these locations? So you're lowering the friction associated with getting a right answer. By and large, I mean, it, it, you're, you're probably in the same boat I am. Your archive doesn't have, uh, it barely has date information, and it barely has a description. But boy, we know where Balloon Boy 
you know, and Denver took off. And the other important part about that is the word balloon boy didn't come about until several days later. So if you search my archives for balloon boy in Denver, you're not going to find him leaving. You're not, you're going to find later on when we called him balloon boy. But if you know the date and you know about where it happened and you've got that metadata, you can start to hone in on that a little bit easier. So if you couple the ingest of the video with frictionless received metadata, I mean, all you do is you get out of the van and I've got the power on the Bluetooth dock turned down so low that by virtue of just getting out of the van, your phone unpairs with it. And then I, you know, I know whose phone that is. And I say, hey, Hank, where did you shoot this? It's, is it one of these places? Did you get out for lunch here? That isn't it, but it's one of the other three. And so we really have to look at how can we not encumber the crews in the field. Go out and ride with your news crews in the evening. See what barriers they have and what they're dealing with. Go switch a newscast. I mean, we all probably at some point used to be a TD. Yeah. Go, go sit next to your TD. What information does he need to get better, faster, stronger? And I think that's really the sort of the most recent aha moment for me. With, uh, with your in-house systems, if you will, because I, I suspect in a couple of years you'll have your own booth at the NAB at this rate. But um, <laughs> how are you guys empowering your teams to uh, share that or be able to say, hey, I got a great idea. Um, I want to try this. Um, how are you empowering your teams so that they can work with you to get to that innovative Me? point? Anybody, anybody here. Well, we do it by keeping track of who gives us a good suggestion. And when we implement that suggestion, we go back to that person and we go, look, your suggestion is right here in the software. How cool is that? And if we really love the suggestion, we might even name the little hook in the software after you, just sort of colloquially, right? <laughs> That's the Sarah Sousa from St. Louis idea. And we talk about it and we may talk about it in the manuals. And when you, you know, we, we have such a short cycle between uh, between the idea of a suggestion being put into it and the time we can get that back out in the field, sometimes it's a matter of days. You do that one or few time, one or two times within an organization, all of a sudden they come at you with, with things they've been thinking about forever, and you, you, you just gotta make sure that you, people love to be recognized, mm -hmm. and, and we love to be recognized. And so you short this cycle in there that, you know, Sarah is one of the biggest suggesters of features. And it's because she likes to have her name out there. She likes to have, right? I, th I think on the vendor side, we're so focused on uh, the development cycles and delivering things to customer expectations. There's the, uh, the roadmap and the timeline that we're delivering on. We tend to get our, our development teams very, very focused on those meetings, the, the, the deadlines. And we, we had an example just a, uh, a couple of weeks ago. Somebody came up to us and they were rather sheepish and they said, um, I actually did something extra. <laughs> and it was, and the first response because we're in this structured mindset was, oh no, that happened because, and that means something else isn't going to be delivered on time. But what they did was actually really, really good. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we need to be flexible in our thinking and, and, and keeping up with timelines, but not to the point that we're actually uh, suppressing uh, creativity and initiative. I mean, because in, in a very big corporate environment, sometimes we do not encourage uh, innovation, and we don't allow the people who are doing the job every single day to offer up ideas, and uh, we don't even engage new companies if you will. There are a lot of new companies out there that could offer solutions that you're doing in a homegrown way or you're seeking out vendors, the, the typical vendors, um, that. And I would, I would say we should encourage our folks to look at some of these uh, newer companies to see how they can solve those problems. Remember that I cheat. I only have one customer. Yeah, exactly. Right? So it's yeah. not like... So, like so, <laughs> so back to our discussion, um, how is, uh, you know, the buzz Upstairs, well, we're on the second floor, right? Upstairs and, and second and third floor today. IP, AI, AR. How is that affecting your business and how are you integrating uh, those technologies? Uh, Mike, are you using? Well, I, I, maybe I'm uh, off the norm here. I don't look at uh, IP as anything other than just a different uh, topology for mm -hmm. uh, accomplishing the mission. 
And um, some people, uh, even in our group, say, well, I'm going to, you know, they put in IP as a buzzword in capital requests. I'm like, yeah, I don't care if it's IP. I don't care really what it is as long as what you're proposing makes sense, it's cost efficient, et cetera. So, I mean, there's other rules that we use to evaluate. So um, where I think that there's great opportunity beyond the IP, and everybody's talking about IP, but we have to have something to talk about, I guess. But I think the, um, the revolution, and uh, Tish touched on it, I think we're all are, are thinking of it, is AI. And AI in a broad bucket, whether it's an AWS initiative, it's an IBM Watson initiative, I mean, we look at something that is as it is one of the weak knees in every, every TV station is closed captioning. Mm -hmm. And uh, we all have issues with closed captioning. It's, it's a uh, big target on our back where the commission will, um, without too much hesitation, throw out a fine, a hefty one, if you don't provide captions that are uh, legible and credible. So what do we do as stations? Well, we contract, usually, outsource it. Um, the technology av available today, you can put in a cheap and cheerful solution that'll do um, uh, speech to text uh, recognition within the station. It's a box that just sits in the station. It requires a little bit more care and feeding than, than normal. Or you can do the, that function to a, a more reliable, uh, higher quality uh, outside partner. Or maybe you do both because you can buy the box and sit it in the rack. It becomes an asset. Uh, or you can then um, supplement that with uh, a Watson-driven solution, which is an OPEX solu um, um, uh, process. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a great opportunity for stations to rethink how they're doing captions right now. Captions, every day we had caption issues with respect to the, the captioner logged in late or they weren't you know, uh, very timely in terms of how quickly they're turning the captions around. And uh, people love to complain about things. And one of the things, I was in, at CBS for a number of years in San Francisco, we had lots of people who were hearing impaired, and so closed caption was a very passionate subject for a, a small group of, of people, uh, very vocal, and so we were really on our toes as a result of it. I think that there are solutions, and I'm just using that as one example. There's probably 20 others that we could come up with, uh, but I think that that's going to uh, present some, uh, some path that we can follow, and it'll lower uh, the risk that we have with respect to compliance. And I'm, I suspect there's many others. What, what's on yours? I, I think that, and I'm going to pull back a little bit, because um, when, when you talked about um, IP, for, mm -hmm. for us, it's, it's just, it's, it's, it's Tuesday. You know, I, it, this, is, this is what we do. Um, and, and this is the direction that we're moving. It's, it's like you were saying, you just, we don't even have the discussion, is it IP or is it not IP? It's just Tuesday. The norm. And, and it's the norm. Um, but I, I, what is exciting to me and, and to our teams is looking outside of the convention, looking outside of the norm, and not going to, like, like when you go to NAB, when we go to NAB, I, we specifically say, I want a couple people to go around the edges, to look around the edges and look and see what's out there, because the edges are going to turn out to be in the middle. I mean, there were, there were years we've been going to NAB for a long time, and we remember Microsoft was way back in the back, and, and Cisco used to be way back in the back. And now look at the booths that they have. Um, and, and so look for non-traditional broadcast um, vendors. They don't, we're such a niche market, they don't know a lot about us. We have to go out and sell ourselves and find out what they're doing and spend time and dig into um, and how that, how that works in our environment. And, and does that mean that we, we don't do a workflow like we always have for the last 20 years? You bet. You bet. We, we're, we're not in a, the last thing that we want to do is take a, a tape workflow and drop it into a digital workflow. It's the last thing we want to do and we fight that um, with, with the end user. <coughs> because it's comfortable, it's what they've done, it's what they've always done, but, it, but it's also comfortable for the technology people because that's the way we've always done it. So we're always pressing ourselves and we're always checking ourselves. Are, are we pushing forward? Are we looking around the corner? And talk about your community journalists. 
Yeah, so um, ABC announced, ABC on television announced uh, maybe a month or so ago that um, we are investing in community journalists across our, our eight markets. It'll start first in Los Angeles. And what we have, have realized is that, especially in LA, it's, it's so big and it's, there's so many pockets and it's very difficult. You have stations here, Nick, you guys have stations out there and, and, and how hard it is to get from point A to point B. So the thought was to go to J schools and to, and to um, work with, with, with the schools to get people coming right out of college who know how to shoot, who know how to edit, and equip them with the cameras and the equipment that they are used to using. Not the big iron. <laughs> it's an iPhone or it's a little DSLR. It's, 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 and they are producing and they are going to send back content that will either be, it'll, it'll, again, it'll flow across all platforms. Um, but it's, it's to be able to get hyper-local, to, to get more stories, to get that local connection in, in our markets. Um, and it's, it's uh, we're really excited about it. We're, we're launching, we're, we, we've, we're building, actually, we're building the kits now and we're figuring out what vehicle they're gonna use and, and you know, figuring all that out, but it's, uh, it's exciting. Anything new in the master control realm? For us, no, not right now. Yeah, anybody? No? Status quo, master control? Um, Anything? Well, I could talk on that for an hour. I'm oh, sitting here I, going, I, well, I know you can, Hank. <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, uh, you know, everybody wants to know about master control in the cloud. And I think that, um, that the key to that is that we have to adhere to the data center standards so that we look and smell and taste just like another customer. If we go into the data center and say we need to be special, we will continue to have problems for the duration and we can't be special. So we look at what is their sweet spot. And again, to your point, how can we modify what we do right. to take advantage of what a data center or a cloud solution provides? And, and how do we have to modify our workflow and our, uh, and our system design and our architecture to take advantage of things that you would, you would find if we were just, you know, I don't know, a dentist office or a insurance, insurance company. company. We got to look like that. We can't expect the cloud providers to treat us special and then complain when we're not 24 seven. We need to fit in. I, I see a lot of focus now and I think it's, it's correct in, in how can we get broadcast workflow and technology to work correctly in the data center, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. But it occurs to me that we're actually putting more emphasis on this than we have in years in making equipment and, and products within the broadcast environment work with each other. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to be looking at that as well. Because when we get to the point that we can tear all of our applications apart and, and, and create services with them, the services drop into an IT uh, architecture inside of Kubernetes, how does that actually come together in, in uh, in business terms, so that those individual services are able to communicate with each other, not just the IT infrastructure, to accomplish something useful. And I think that's the next area that we need to be looking at. Yeah, and mm -hmm. I'll, I'll just add um, a little bit to that. I, I think that Hank's 100% right in that, uh, yes, we tend to be, we're special, we're broadcaster, don't you know what broadcast quality is? I'm, all that uh, I agree with. But there's also an opportunity, and I think that there are companies that uh, I'm aware of one, at least maybe anybody's heard of Amagi, which created a, uh, a layer, basically an app, on, I, I think it's Amazon, it may run on other platforms, uh, and it's a mass control in the cloud uh, that does graphics, it does uh, lower, th it does everything. And uh, it's, it's you know, relatively uh, cheap and cheerful compared to some of the other solutions, and, and that happens to be just one. I suspect that there may be a plethora of others that are out there that you know, we just don't know about. But clearly, you know, the AWSs, the Azures of the world, they have a lot of computing power, a lot of storage power, and typically uh, pretty robust connectivity and security. So it, it stands to reason 
that uh, someone creating a, um, a layer that's managed that runs across that data center environment, uh, and it can do any number of things. In our world, you know, we're looking at switching video, uh, archiving video. Does it really matter that you archive on a storage tech robot that's in the corner, uh, or do you maybe have an inexpensive uh, storage array, and then it points to a cloud, mm -hmm. whether it be an on, uh, on-premise solution or, or public or private. The, so the secret sauce is the, is the software, it's not the hardware. And I think many, many times we get so focused on the hardware, the fact that it's IP versus something else. Mm -hmm. And I think ultimately, um, you know, we want to see what the result is. And Tish coined an interesting phrase, she said, you know, called what, what Hank does for Tribune, Hankware. And it's really brilliant. It works for that environment. But when we take that, extract it out, and say how many other Hanks are there that are creating solutions uh, on a broader basis, there's probably a lot more that we just don't know about. Yeah. You guys are having fun creating new stuff. And uh, I want to, you know, security is a huge issue. Mike brought it up a little earlier. Um, how are you dealing with cybersecurity um, <coughs> in the next couple years? What do, you, what do you fathom for that? Well, I think first and foremost, it's ever changing. It's not. Uh, it's not something that you can say. Well, I did uh, a pen test uh, a year ago. I'm. I'm good. Right. I've. I've adhered to all the recommendations that came out of that pen test. It's something that has to be addressed each and every day. Uh, and um, we've gone through a pretty substantial uh, metamorphosis in in our organization with respect to where we were with security three years ago, versus where we are now. And we uh, set out on a, on a two-year plan after we did a pretty comprehensive uh, pen test, penetration test. Uh, many of you may have heard of those or, or perhaps uh, in, um, taken, taken them under uh, in your organization. But we had a map from that pen test. And then along the way, things changed. And we're talking about in months. Mm -hmm. Here we had a, a, this is what we're gonna do. Two, three months later, something else was a better solution, and we changed direction. Um, and I think that uh, it's, it's probably more important than anybody uh, gives it credit for. We don't really have an example within the United States that is uh, as gross as it would um, probably need to be in order for everybody to sit up and take notice. But there are a lot of people from Homeland Security, FBI, um, that are working on cybersecurity issues as it relates to broadcast, and I, I should not exclude NAB. Uh, so I definitely encourage everybody to reach out to the NAB to familiarize yourself as much as possible with what's uh, available in terms of tools, resources, best practices. Um, there will be someone who will become a poster child. Mm -hmm. I pray That's that right. it's not me or anybody here, but it will happen. And um, I think the better we can be prepared for it, uh, it's going to serve us better going forward. From the, the vendor perspective, um, we're very concentrated on not becoming an attack vector into your organizations. And we have to think about things like how, how do we make sure the software we're distributing is clean, mm -hmm. and make sure that we don't have anything in, inside of that. But also, uh, more esoteric things like how do we protect your passwords? Mm -hmm. because just about every vendor has some access into the, uh, the, the customer systems at this mm -hmm. point. So that includes the standard things like encrypting at rest, restricting access, logging those, uh, those things, masking them whenever they're being used, all that sort of thing. So it, it, that, that's what I worry about at night. And, and, and I think that w when you asked earl an earlier question about, well, w what are you doing in IP? Um, and I said, well, it's just Tuesday. I think vendors have taken time to, to understand what security means at a local station. And it's, it's taking, um, they're better, and I'm, and I'm speaking broadly here obviously, but, but, but I, there, there have been times where we've put systems in and we talk about what is your security and they've been, what are you talking about? What, what is, and, and now you can't bring a piece of equipment in without going through a pen test, without going through a security review. And, and I will say vendors have gotten much better and are really starting to understand um, the importance of, of security and, and not just their piece of equipment being secure, but as it, it, it to your point, you've got, you've got third party coming in and how is that secure? Just things like you know, passwords being stored 
in a secure mode, it's, it's um, the relationship that you have with the customer and the vendor is just as important as the relationship you have with inside of a television station. And then there's always somebody that walks in with a USB key that all the security you put, <laughs> all the hard work that you do can get blown up in a, in a second. Yeah. So. so we, we have, uh, I, I do want to offer a question uh, or so for the audience. Um, we have a microphone. I here. understand Nick Gold is got the first question. <laughs> Nick, got a question he's there. like the, what was the AP, Helen Thomas. Helen Thomas. Uh, role of Helen Thomas today we played by Nick Gold, <laughs> who told us in the hallway that he'd come up with a great question. How, uh, um, this has been a great no conversation, stress. guys. Thank you very much. I'm Nick Gold with Chesapeake Systems. I ask a lot of questions at these things. Um, one of the questions I have when, when we're thinking about innovation and the innovation that is ever present in the kind of technology architecture world that we deal with every day, you know, I, I'm, you know, in all my years of working with, you know, the O&Os or broadcasters, you know, engineering predominantly is seen as a cost center. Mm -hmm. And yet I think a lot of us who get into the architecture side of, of broadcast and media are very creative technologists. And I think we see a lot of opportunities that may be more revenue generating in nature. Um, maybe it is, we, we have these archives we can do stuff with and there's now tools that will help us automate, you know, making it more you know, useful to us and, and, and potentially profitable. Do your organizations and the business leaders within them see the engineering teams as a, a valuable source of input on the innovation side and coming up with new products and being potentially revenue generators and not just cost centers. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'll tell you this, that if you bring in a new electronic toy and you give it to somebody who adopts it in the newsroom, you become the cool place to work. I mean, I think that's, that's part of what we're doing is, is we're competing at the person. It's all about people. We know it is on the air, and you can bet that it is. I mean, how many people come from places where it's hard to find a producer, right? Isn't everybody looking for producers? So if you can be the cool place to work, if you can be the, the place that brings in the new 360 cameras, what's it going to cost you to buy 10 new 360 cameras, 4K? Right? You bring in the new 360 cameras, all of a sudden one videographer just clings to it, right? And, and, and you just give it to him, and you say, go do something great. Yeah. Next thing you know, he's posting stuff on the weekends. He's posted, you know, and, it, and you get, so, so, um, so we're a necessary evil. Yes, we are a big negative sign. There's no question that engineering, you know, it's been a long time since we've gone on a sales call, but really we go on every sales call, <laughs> right? We go on every, so we represent the station regardless of, of what we're doing. If you can, if you can retain good people, by being a great place to work and uh, and making sure that you know uh, you know the names and you know who's you know you put a new drone out there I've got a guy in Salt Lake City that has just become consumed with this new drone and I'm getting video out of him that I never would have gotten if I just hadn't sprinkled a dozen drones around the group so I think you've got to look at a certain percentage of your capital as uh, as retention as the fun as the end of it go break this. Right? How about yeah. at ABC? Yeah. How about yeah. you guys? Yeah. yeah. You know, I find that now that I'm consulting and not working for a corporation, when I'm trying to sell technology, one of the best ways to do it, to your point, is to figure out how they can market this. Is this drone, can I put a sales uh, a, a, a sponsor attached to mm -hmm. it? Can it, can it be the Coca-Cola drone? Can it be the, and to, trust me, that has become more palatable when you can assign an ad to whatever you're trying to do, and that way you get a return on investment. And it's up to them, once you hand them the tools, because our role as engineers and operations people is to hand folks the tools so they can tell the story, and also so that they can uh, use it as a monetization yeah. for, for, for revenue. And so I think with that point, uh, am I allowed to have one more question? Is there one more question, one last question? No? Okay, good. Thank you, panel. You guys were awesome. We could talk about this all day, I think. We could. We could. So give them <laughs>